Howdy. Today we're going to talk about things that are not quite crystalline, uh, but definitely not amorphous as well. Uh, and we're going to start off by talking about liquid crystals. And liquid crystals are particularly important because they interact with light uh, in interesting and important ways. Uh, specifically, they can change the polarization of light. And so this is basically an image of shining polarized light through a film of liquid crystals. And you can see at some parts um, the light is basically rotated and slowed, some part the um, the light is, is canceled out because it's uh, rotated and it's uh, uh, rotated at an angle that's, that's canceled out by the uh, polarizer um, that is between the film and where we're looking at it. Um, so that might seem like a little bit of an academic and not an interesting thing at all uh, until you remember that a lot of technology is based on liquid crystals. So a liquid crystal display is basically a something like a monitor or TV where we use a thin film of liquid crystal materials to turn on and off each pixel. Uh, and we do that specifically by changing their internal structure, changing how they're oriented so that it affects how they interact with polarized light. So we're going to start talking about um, what these materials are. This first video is going to basically focus on some definitions about what are liquid crystals, what are some of the different kinds of liquid crystals. Uh, and we're going to talk about short and long range order in these systems. And we're going to follow up by another video where we're focusing primarily on quantitative structural descriptors of liquid crystals. And again, the thing to think about is we're, we're sort of occupying the spectrum somewhere in between amorphous materials and the fully crystalline materials that we've been talking about pre uh, previously. So in order to get started, let's think about um, how we described these different systems before. Um, and atomic crystalline solids, so these are things like metals or um, ionic solids, um, the individual components of that crystal structure are atoms. Um, so in this case, this is an ionic solid, so there might be some cations and some anions, but the individual components are atoms. And the bonding between the principal components is strong primary bonding. And so in this case, that might be ionic bonding. In other cases, we might be talking about covalent bonding or metallic bonding, but the, the point is that this is very strong primary bonding. Um, so bond enthalpies can be quite strong between individual atoms. So let's move on to think about a molecular crystalline solid. And so what do I mean by a molecular crystalline solid? In this case, the individual components aren't atoms, but they're molecules. Uh, and so this is an example of uh, ice. This is one crystal structure that water mo molecules can take. Um, keep in mind, there's not just one kind of ice, depending on the temperature and the pressure that you're at. There are dozens of different uh, crystal structures that have been observed or proposed for ice. Um, but the important thing here is that the individual components aren't atoms anymore, but rather they're molecules. Um, and so that means that the bonding between these principal components tends to be secondary bonding. So in this case, there are you know, relatively strong hydrogen bonds. If the molecules that we're talking about are something like methane, then it could be a weaker form of secondary bonding. Um, but it, in general, it's a lot less strong than the primary bonding in the atomic solids that we were, were thinking about before. So the final question I have here is, what are the internal degrees of freedom? And by that, I mean, how much uh, freedom or flexibility does each of these molecules have? Can it have translational degrees of freedom? So could it be positioned there or maybe a little bit to the left or maybe a little bit to the right? Um, or does it have rotational degrees of freedom? So is this uh, orientation exactly defined or could this uh, be free to, to rotate around some particular axis? And so in this molecular crystalline solid, we still have zero internal degrees of freedom because there's no translational freedom positions of each of these molecules are relatively are, are fixed in this unit cell uh, and there's no rotational degrees of freedom either. Each of these angles is determined uh, and the, the water molecule essentially is frozen. It's stuck in that one position. So this is a crystalline solid but a crystalline solid that's made of molecules as opposed to made of atoms. So this is this is still very much what we've been talking about previously. This is a crystalline material. We would use the same terms, unit cells, lattice translation vectors, to describe this solid. Now this is different from what we're going to start talking about in this class. And these are called liquid crystals. And I know that the phrase might be a little bit confusing because we see that word crystals again. 
but the important thing here is that they're liquid crystals. And so we got to talk about what does that mean? Um, and let's ask the same question. So what are the individual components in liquid crystals? Um, ultimately, they're still molecules. So the individual components are still molecules, but we call them something different. We call them mesogens. So each of these uh, long ellipsoids, it represents a molecule, but because it's part of a liquid crystal, we call it a mesogen. That's the basic building block of a liquid crystal. The bonding uh, between mesogens, again, is relatively weak secondary bonding. Um, so that means that they, they're not these stronger, more rigid primary bonds, but um, that gives it the property that now we can start to introduce internal degrees of freedom. Um, and I'm just going to say greater than zero or, or yes at this point. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, these different liquid crystal structures um, because they have different numbers of internal degrees of freedom. Um, but just in general, you can see that, you know, for example, in this pneumatic crystal, um, there is some translational freedom. You know, if I look at one molecule and I look at the position of another molecule relative to that, this one is not fixed in a well-defined rigid point in space. There's some variability in terms of where that molecule could be. So there's some um, translational freedom. Um, rotational freedom, you know, maybe these things are free to rotate around their long axis, um, but less free to rotate around some axis that's perpendicular to the long, the long uh, axis. So um, greater than zero internal degrees of freedom. And the answer to that question is what we're going to focus on for a lot of the rest of the lecture today. Um, and so building up, you know, another way to think about these things is that liquid crystals, they occupy this space somewhere between liquids and crystals. Uh, and it's because there's a competition between um, bond strength. So how rigidly um, fixed is, is this um, position between one building block and another? Um, and, and entropy terms, so that we know it at higher temperature, there tends to be more disorder in the system. Um, and liquid crystals are kind of somewhere along the spectrum. So if we, if we start off at a high temperature, you know, things could be a gas, a very volatile um, phase. And so there's a, a lot of disorder in the system. As we start to cool down, you know, gases will condense, they can form liquids. And so they're uh, relatively more uh, compact, but there's still a lot of disorder. And then traditionally, you know, we think at some temperature, if we get low enough, that liquid will crystallize into a crystalline solid. And in a crystalline solid, the, uh, the terms related to uh, bond strength tend to win out over these temperature-based entropy terms. And so that means that there's not enough energy in the system to overcome the, the localized potential energy well that is fixing each of these, um, you know, units in place. Liquid crystals are kind of somewhere in between. You know, they're, they're somewhere in between the liquids and the crystals. And so we can say that they have um, a little bit less disorder than liquids. So in this particular case, things seem to be all relatively lined up in a particular direction, but they're not quite as ordered uh, as a, uh, a traditional crystal is. Um, and so again, there are different kinds of liquids uh, and we're gonna talk about the differences between these different types shortly. Um, the very uh, first level, um, we can classify liquid crystals uh, by the shape of the molecule. Um, and it's important to note that um, the shape is what gives it uh, some degree of order. So things tend to, um, for example, if we have a rod-like structure, a long axis in a molecule, this is something that's relatively rigid and so it wants to maintain a rod, you tend to have these kind of molecules lining up uh, with respect to each other. Um, similarly, if I have a, a flat or planar molecule, um, it might make something that looks a lot more like a disc and discs will tend to stack on top of one each of each, on top of one another, um, something like this. Um, so we can, we can classify these things into rod-like or calamitic, uh, types of liquid crystals or disc-like or discotic. Um, I tend to just use the simpler terms rod-like or disc-like. We can also have polymer liquid crystals. And so... Liquid crystal, again, there's, there's these individual building blocks, the things that we called mesogens. And in a polymer liquid crystal, mesogens are either in the main chain of the polymer uh, or they're uh, appearing as side chains along uh, a polymer backbone. 
Um, and, and these again have uh, unique properties because now uh, the position and how these messages can stack is constrained by this backbone polymer itself. Uh, and finally, there's another pretty unique class of messages that we'll deal with later. Uh, and these are called amphiphilic. And so amphi means both and philic means uh, liking. Uh, so they're, they're molecules that like two things. And the two things that they like are uh, apolar solvents and polar solvents. So um, apolar solvents are things like hydrocarbons and uh, oils. Um, and polar solvents are things like water uh, that have strong dipoles. Uh, and so because they have this uh, sort of split personality situation, um, when you put a bunch of amphiphilic molecules into one kind of a solvent uh, or another, they tend to organize themselves so that the, the tail or the head, the, the part that tends to interact with one kind of solvent or another is exposed to the solvent that it likes. Um, and a perfect example of this is a lot of detergents and soap molecules. The way these work, you know, we think about the solvent that we use them in is water. You're washing your hands uh, and you put some of these amphiphilic molecules. Well, they'll tend to make, you know, little, little spheroidal shells around oil droplets and particles, and then they'll be washed away in the solvent. Um, and so the reason detergents and soaps like that work is that they're picking up oils and residues on your hands or on uh, clothing, uh, and they're allowing it to be washed away in the solvent. Okay, so now we're going to um, talk a little bit more about these different classes um, of liquid crystals. Uh, and the two main ones are pneumatic and smectic. There's also uh, cholesteric liquid crystals. These are, these are also re referred to as twisted pneumatic um, and columnar liquid crystals. Um, and we're going to ask these same basic questions of each of them. Um, do they have directional order? Do they have translational order? And we're going to focus on both sort of a, a short range degree of order. So the, the molecules that are immediately surrounding that original molecule and, and long range order. So think of a molecule uh, that's about 10 to 100 uh, molecule lengths away from our, our, our central point. Um, do we still know something about the, ori the, uh, the position or the orientation of that molecule in that, in that same place? So pneumatic structures, um, the first question, let's think about short range order first. Do they have directional order and do they have translational order? And what do we mean by these terms? So directional order is if I think about the molecules surrounding this initial central molecule, are they all pointing and aligned in the same direction? Um, and so again, we, we, we have to be a little careful when we answer this question because it depends on what rotational axis we're talking about. So they all tend to be pointing uh, in the same way. So they're kind of lined up. Um, and so in that sense, if I think about a, an axis that's perpendicular to the screen, um, the rotation angle is pretty darn close between all of these nearby molecules. Um, on the other hand, if I think about a rotational axis that is along the long axis of the molecule, well, they're, they're, they're relatively free to rotate around that rotational axis. Um, and, and they're, they're kind of unperturbed by the surrounding molecules. Um, and so this is an one where it sort of depends. I'm going to say yes slash no. Yes, because if I'm looking at axes, they're perpendicular plane. Again, all these molecules are sort of pointing left to right, um, but they are free to rotate um, around that central axis. Um, do they have translational order? So let's think about when we were talking about amorphous solids, um, we know that there is always some degree of short range order. If I see um, you know, uh, a molecule here, it's going to have nearest neighbors that are going to be you know, some pretty well-defined distance away. Um, and that's just because of the shape of the molecule and the surrounding molecules. So there is definitely short range translational order. Um, but by the time I get to a much greater distance away, uh, we've lost that translational order. So I can't tell you anything about the exact position of, of this particular mesogen with respect to um, that starting point um, if, if, it's, if it's some number of molecule lengths away. Um, directional order, again, they kind of have this overall direction that they're pointing in. Um, and, and I think really we should, we should focus on um, this one particular aligned 
uh, direction. Um, usually we don't care too much about rotation around that elongated axis. Um, so, you know, there's an argument that uh, under some circumstances you could say um, they're free to spin along their long axis, but really the thing that we're, we're focusing on overall is, is the, the orientation of this particular rod. Um, so we're, we're going to go on and talk about the others, but I want to pause and I want to bring back up something that we had, had learned when we were dealing with amorphous materials, and that's this idea of a pair distribution function. So the pair distribution function describes the probability of finding a mesogen in a particular position. Um, and one thing that's useful is to schematically draw the pair distribution function um, in two directions, either perpendicular to the principal uh, director, so perpendicular to the direction that these are pointing, or along the direction, parallel to it. So we're going to do perpendicular first. Let's think about what does that pair distribution function look like if I were going to draw it perpendicular to this orientation that the mesogens are lined up. I'm going to give you a second to think about it. I'm going to go ahead and my, draw my axes while we're doing this. So, you know, usually we say this is G of R, this is a probability distribution. And so one is uh, sort of the average probability of being aligned in a particular direction. Uh, and this is a radial distance. And so we know, just like other molecules, there's some um, minimum position uh, that these mesogens can't be on top of one of each other. Um, and then there's going to be some average nearest neighbor distance. And that's going to be the, the maximum of this first peak. And then there's a little bit of an exclusion zone after that. And then I have my second nearest neighbor, maybe my third nearest neighbor. But after about that, um, we're going to hit our correlation length. <laughs> this is chi, the Greek layer chi. Correlation length, that, remember, that's the distance after which we don't have any additional information about where the position of the next molecule would be. And so if I'm looking at it in a, in a perpendicular direction, um, my plot might look something like this. Now I'm going to change colors here um, and draw the uh, pair distribution function along the principal director. And what's it going to look like in that direction? One, one way to think about this is how is it going to vary from what I've just drawn? Do we have any additional translational order along this particular direction? The answer to that is no. Oops. Um, where we also are you know, relatively disordered along the principal director uh, distance or direction. Um, but there is one thing different, and that's just this nearest neighbor distance is going to tend to be a lot longer uh, along that distance than it is uh, perpendicular to that direction. So if I was going to draw the pair distribution function, and maybe I'll do it on the same axis, um, you would just, it would just be stretched out a lot more. I would still have a first nearest neighbor, a second nearest neighbor, maybe a third nearest neighbor, and then we would sort of flatten out. Um, so in general, these share a lot of characteristics. Um, but because the molecules are elongated, um, it's stretched out uh, when I'm looking along that one, uh, that second direction. So this is my uh, overlap. So this is the, the hard sphere radius, essentially, uh, and the nearest neighbor direction um, along the, what, what we call the principal director. That's basically the, the vector that is um, lying along the direction that all these messages are pointing. Okay, so that was uh, a, a pneumatic structure. Um, next, we're going to think about something called a twisted pneumatic structure. Um, and in many cases, this behaves relatively similarly. Um, translational order, uh, again, we'll have some short range translational order, but we have no particular long range order. Um, directional order, the only thing that's different now is that instead of all of these uh, rod-like liquid crystals pointing in one particular direction and that direction staying the same, they tend to twist. So the principal director is changing in orientation and the, the, the way it's pointing is a function of some distance. So, and so this is shown as P here. Um, and you can, in fact, you can describe uh, the periodicity 
in terms of some sort of a sinusoidal function. And so we could say that um, the, uh, the, you know, the spacing between um, uh, uh, or the distance that it takes to do a full rotation uh, is given by um, this 2 pi z over lambda uh, term. Um, so in terms of directional order, coming back here, uh, they still have short range order. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk about the fact that they could be rotated around that axis. Let's think about the the way that the director is pointing. There definitely is short range order. There definitely is some long range order, but now that long range order is not static. The the direction, rather than being fixed over space, the direction the molecules are pointing tends to twist over space. And that's why these are called twisted pneumatic structures. The next class is called smectic structures, and these are a little bit different. Um, and the reason that they're different is because they have some additional translational order. Um, so again, directional order, um, they tend to be pointing in the same direction as their surrounding molecules. Um, if I go 10 to 100 molecules away, they're still kind of pointing in the same direction. They could be um, pointing perpendicular to these layers, or they could be tilted. So that's the difference between smectic A or smectic C. But the biggest difference between smectic structures, and if we go back to pneumatic structures, is that smectic structures have these layers that we don't see in the pneumatic structures. Um, so I could call this layer one, two, three, and the molecules tend to fall in one of those layers. And so what that means is that, you know, while yes, they have some short range translational order, they also have some longer range translational order because they tend to fall in a layer, although that is only in one direction. So if I think about a direction perpendicular to the layers, let's call this X, then I could tell you with some certainty positionally where these uh, molecules are. But if I think about another direction, let's say a direction within a layer, we can call that Y, you don't have any additional information uh, in terms of the long range packing of these molecules. So they're restricted to layers. There's some, some degree of translational order, um, but they are disordered within a particular layer. And that's what this no refers to. Um, so if we're going to do that same thing, draw that pair distribution function, um, if we were going to draw it perpendicular uh, to the principal director, um, again, that would be, uh, let me switch my pointer color, um, this red direction. Uh, that's going to look very similar to before um, because within a particular layer, you know, I, I might have a nearest neighbor, a second nearest neighbor, a third nearest neighbor, and then I'm, I, I've hit my correlation length and I, I don't have any additional order within a layer. Um, but that's going to look very differently uh, if we're like thinking about a pair distribution function that is um, the parallel to the principal director. Um, and what that means is along the direction that these molecules are pointing, that's also perpendicular to the layers. And so as opposed to um, this first direction, you know, now there's a, there's a pretty ri rigid periodicity where these molecules tend to find themselves um, either in a layer or not in a layer. And so I'm just going to say that this extends out some distance. Um, and so these peaks are associated with uh, the position centroids of each of these layers where you're more likely to find the center of a molecule. And these valleys, let's, uh, let's call them X's here, are where I have a lower probability of finding the molecule. Um, and that's the positions that are in between uh, the individual layers. Um, and, and these can extend, again, many, many hundreds of atomic lengths, so a, a significant distance. So you can, it's fair to say that you do have some long range order um, uh, perpendicular to the layers, meaning that the molecules tend to be occupying positions within these layers. Um, columnar can be somewhat more complicated, uh, and it depends on the actual shape uh, of, the, of the thing that you have. And so again, we can have things like disks, we can have things like rods, things like rings, things like wedges. Um, again, these tend to uh, stack on top of each other. Um, and so in some cases, 
You might have some uh, translational order perpendicular to the direction they're stacking, and you definitely have translational order um, along the direction of stacking, um, but that could be a little bit different. So, um, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll leave this to you to think about, um, but uh, you'd ask the same kinds of questions. Uh, where do we see directional order, translational order, and, and how are these different from smectic structures? Um, so the, I think I have a couple more points I'd like to wrap up with. We, we define these as occupying sort of this position between a crystal and a liquid. Uh, and the variable here on this axis is temperature. And so we can use temperature to undergo a transition between a crystal, let's say, and a liquid crystal. Or if I heated the system up further, I could go from a liquid crystal to a liquid. Um, a phase change um, that is caused by a change in temperature is a thermotropic transition or a thermotropic phase boundary. We can also have changes um, in their order based on a, a concentration of solvents. So how many solvent molecules, that's what these little purple dots are supposed to re represent, um, per uh, the concentration of mesogens. So a lyotropic phase transition is a phase change that's caused by a change in uh, sort of the concentration of solvents. Um, and so generally, you could think about this as, you know, I have molecules that are dissolved in some solvent, and maybe I'm evaporating a solvent. Um, and at some point, they're going to start to arrange in these liquid crystal structures. And I'm going to wrap up with this. The next video is going to talk about some of the quantitative measures of order in liquid crystal structures in more detail.